Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for uh, attending today to this uh, webinar. If it's okay with you, we'll give it another two minutes because I, I see people are still uh, joining. So just two more minutes for people to join, and then we'll jump into it and start the webinar. Okay, so once again, hello everybody, and thank you for joining us today for this uh, webinar. Um, we know uh, this is a, a challenging times, definitely a very unique situation, um, and we uh, I appreciate the time you took to join us on this uh, uh, call today. Hopefully, the next uh, um, um, uh, uh, half an hour or so, uh, you'll enjoy um, and hear new things regarding implementing AI in endoscopy. Uh, my name is uh, Shmulik Shapiro, and my uh, uh, colleague, Moshe Safran, who is the CEO of our activities in the States, will be actually uh, um, hosting most of the event today. Um, yeah, we have quite a few uh, joining us. Great, so we, we can actually start. Uh, Moshe, would you like to take your microphone and uh, start the webinar at all? Sure, thank you, Shmulik. Uh, just to reiterate again, thanks everybody for joining us and hope that everybody and all their friends and loved ones are uh, doing okay at this time. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about implementing AI in endoscopy. Uh, I, I'd like to sort of uh, use a broad brush to cover uh, a variety of tasks and applications uh, and together with that to uh, get into uh, a few specifics in terms of use cases uh, and hands-on tips and various uh, uh, insights that we can share from our experience and uh, from our learnings of the field uh, and the space in general. Uh, so uh, just to sort of so that you know who we are, and I apologize uh, to those of you who already know us, and this may not be new uh, to you. So we are RSIP Vision. We are a solutions provider for AI and computer vision uh, for medical applications. Uh, we've been around uh, as a company for over 25 years and are happy uh, to have uh, grown uh, a pretty big uh, group of almost 50 engineers and uh, developers. Uh, we do customized development for uh, project needs. Uh, we have medical team and annotation teams as well uh, in staff. Uh, we see ourselves sort of as uh, enablers, uh, one of the many enablers for the uh, current uh, revolution in AI and computer vision uh, that's going on both in the medical space uh, as well as in many other uh, uh, markets. Uh, so if uh, this can be likened sort of to a gold rush and everybody is uh, scrambling to get the value for their patients and for their uh, uh, products and for their uh, uh, business uh, uh, out of this uh, technology. Uh, and uh, we see our role as enabling this, providing uh, the tools, uh, so to speak, uh, to enable uh, the various players. Um, we work in many domains of applications from cardiology to pulmonology to orthopedics to ophthalmology, as well as a, a few endoscopy applications that we have uh, done and we're uh, working on uh, as we speak. Uh, because we are as a company focused on AI and computer vision applications, uh, analyzing image data and spatial data, uh, we're pretty modality uh, agnostic and we've worked with uh, almost any uh, 
conceivable medical modality uh, that can be. Uh, these are some of our uh, projects uh, that we've done uh, for medical device companies from uh, chest CT segmentation to heart chamber reconstruction, some uh, academic collaborations as well. Uh, I don't want to get uh, uh, too much more into that, just so that you sort of uh, uh, know uh, who we are and uh, how we see our role uh, in this uh, community of uh, AI uh, and computer vision in the medical application space. Uh, so. I'm going to talk about uh, three topics. Again, we only have a half hour, so it'll sort of be a, a, a broader uh, a review. Uh, the first one is segmentation, detection, and classification. This is sort of the bread and butter of uh, uh, computer vision tasks and bread, of, bread and butter of what is now uh, known as deep learning and uh, AI. Uh, these are, tasks are not always lumped uh, uh, together in this way. Uh, but uh, for for some of the endoscopic examples that we've uh, worked on and come across, uh, it does make sense to consider uh, these tasks uh, together. Uh, the second topic I'd like to cover a bit is uh, tracking and motion estimation. So this comes up in a variety of contexts in endoscopy, uh, uh, tracking either the speed of a scope or its location uh, uh, in various coordinate systems for different use cases. And the, the third uh, topic I'd like to touch upon as well is uh, video analysis, specifically action recognition uh, in videos. Uh, this has uh, already also become a, a pretty mature uh, part of AI technology uh, that's used uh, both for non-medical applications and is already used uh, for, uh, and is applicable already for uh, endoscopic and medical applications uh, as well. So uh, before before I get started on, on uh, some uh, uh, case studies, I'd like to talk a bit about the challenges that we are seeing uh, from our experience and from uh, many other people's experience as well uh, in endoscopic video. Uh, so the first challenge is image variability. So uh, at least in some cases, uh, the system uh, sometimes needs to support more than one type of, uh, of camera or scope. It, again, depending on the use case, sometimes just a single device, a costly device that's fully controlled uh, uh, by the uh, uh, medical device provider. In other cases, uh, we need to uh, work with uh, uh, data that's been collected from a variety of sites. Uh, images can look different from each other very much because of the hardware and also because of the behavior of users. So some users may be very skilled. They may be manipulating the scope uh, uh, in an orderly manner, and uh, the video is not going to jump around too much. And sometimes uh, there's a lot more noise in the video because of the way uh, the system is used. And image variability is across multiple axes. So there can be strong variability in colors, in motion, in the fidelity of the video. Uh, and these challenges are more common uh, uh, in the endoscopic domain when compared, say, uh, to radiology, uh, CT scanners, uh, x ray, et cetera, in which there are, you know, a variety of, of CT protocols and slice thicknesses and all that, but uh, really we find in many cases in endoscopic video, uh, these challenges are, are uh, much, uh, much more important to, to address early on. Uh, the second challenge is clinical variability between patients, uh, and this is both uh, in the way they're, uh, uh, if we're looking for some abnormality in the scene, the way those abnormalities uh, appear, can be different between patients and also uh, on the procedure itself. So for instance, in a colonoscopy, some patients may have a, a good bowel prep and then the uh, scene is very uh, uh, easy to understand and there aren't too many occluders. In other, other patients will have a poor bowel prep and then the uh, scene will look completely different or, or maybe the colon is, is uh, uh, everything looks sort of uh, smaller and less uh, uh, distended. Uh, and uh, the aim is to make uh, the solutions as robust as possible uh, to this clinical variability and also to understand it, to understand uh, uh, what the requirements, if any, on the input are uh, and understand where the algorithm is working better uh, and where uh, some requirements need to be uh, imposed. Uh, there are also, sorry, uh, uh, image quality challenges. So beyond the differences, the variability between images, uh, there are many frames of, of these videos that you can't see anything at all. Some smoke may come up into the scene, say in surgical video, and then disappear. Uh, so uh, this also needs to be dealt with. Uh, and of course, we're dealing uh, with 
typically in endoscopic applications with soft tissue. So the scene is constantly uh, deforming. The actions of the doctor, of the user itself, can apply changes to the scene, obviously in surgical video, but also in other procedures. Uh, uh, the uh, gastroenterologist may uh, uh, what's called take a bite with the biopsy forceps, and then there will be blood, but this blood is not an indication of any uh, 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 disorder. In the patient is just a result of the procedure itself. The procedure may involve introducing uh, some devices or implants into the scene that's going to change the scene itself, uh, and it makes it uh, uh, more challenging. Uh, beyond uh, the, the uh, specific challenges that we deal here in the images themselves, uh, there are also challenges in the data as far as ground truth is concerned, because typically uh, in these situations, the agreement between the experts is lower uh, than, say, in uh, uh, radiology uh, uh, image analysis or probably even in uh, digital pathology. Uh, um, if you have multiple experts uh, rating a, a video or a scene, in many cases, they will not agree with each other and you need to be aware of this. Uh, from the get-go and deal with it correctly. And annotations, and this uh, coming uh, from the uh, second bullet point here, uh, because these uh, videos are difficult to interpret, annotations are very uh, expensive and time-consuming, uh, and you can't always count on having the whole data set annotated, uh, even over the course of an entire project, and definitely not at the start of a project. Uh, so you need ways of creating a quick initial solution that will be uh, good enough on a very limited ground truth data, and then work your way up uh, from there. Uh, okay, so I'll get into the first topic of classification, segmentation, and detection. Uh, I put classification first, so uh, let's let's uh, look at an example, a uh, gastro example, uh, classification of the inflammatory bowel uh, disease diagnosis. Uh, this includes uh, uh, colitis and Crohn's disease, uh, which are uh, characterized uh, by various ulcers and erosions uh, in the colon. Uh, the, uh, the scoring system that is used for this is typically, uh, it can be likened to a classification problem. So uh, uh, just uh, to reproduce that kind of scoring system, one would need to classify even a whole patient. Are there ulcers present? Are there erosions present or not? or to classify a single frame. Uh, so the task, uh, uh, the basic task can start from a classification. Uh, excuse me if you guys are hearing some kids uh, in the background there. Uh, we're all uh, sheltering in place here in California. Uh, I hope you can still hear me well. Uh, so even if we're starting with a classification problem, it, uh, it doesn't mean that we want to use classification network architecture. So in, in many situations, uh, uh, we find that it's uh, more effective to train the network on what's called the multitask learning. Uh, so instead of just telling the network training time uh, if the frame is abnormal or not, or the Mayo score level of zero through three on a certain frame, it's much better, uh, at least for some of the data, to have the locations of these abnormalities annotated and to formulate this as a segmentation or a detection problem. Uh, and then uh, technically you can have your, uh, say, at a segmentation architecture, and you can uh, uh, also have this architecture output uh, a classification. Uh, we find that this makes the training much more uh, effective. Uh, you get a uh, uh, faster convergence of the training and better results on more limited data because you are feeding the network much more uh, information. Uh, another uh, typical uh, uh, sort of a, a thing that's needed to be done here is pretty aggressive data augmentation. If the data is very limited, you need to pre-process it even uh, manually, so to speak, uh, by, uh, by introducing like explicit uh, uh, more classical rules to pre-process the data uh, when, in, you know, uh, more... Uh, 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 Shmuli, can you still hear me? I yes, loud and clear. Great, yeah, I got this... Uh, this uh, notification that the connection to the server was lost. Good. Uh, so, yeah, so in, in the, usually the best practice in deep learning today is not to worry too much about data processing, pre-processing, and just to try to make the network adaptive to anything by augmentation, by expanded data set. But uh, if the data set is very small, then this will be needed because the variability is very strong. And another important component of this task 
is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, detecting the non-informative trade. So instead of trying uh, uh, the trade or even just a prediction time to ask the network to uh, classify or to segment all of the frames, uh, it's uh, uh, very important in this and, and, and some other cases to train a separate module that will uh, detect which frames should be used and which frames uh, should be ignored. Uh, so so uh, it, it's, it makes a lot of sense to break the problem into uh, a few separate stages and modules and not just try to solve it end to end. Uh, a more uh, sort of a, a common task in a, a GI is polyp detection and cancer detection. Uh, uh, people have been uh, going after this uh, uh, challenge for uh, many years, and in the last few years with deep learning, uh, this is actually uh, working. Uh, here, uh, the, so so that there's a large body of work on this already, and, uh, and some nice successes, even some products in the market. Uh, the trends here are uh, moving to fast detection architectures like YOLO and SSD in order to achieve this uh, polyp detection in real time, uh, giving up uh, pixel-wise segmentation trade-off, uh, but uh, getting fast real-time detection. Uh, people are using a lot of pre-training and natural images and deep feature extractors. Uh, and uh, th these are sort of the more recent best practices that people discovered in this space. And uh, uh, this task, which, uh, you know, uh, five years ago was probably still considered uh, nearly impossible and uh, is now uh, people are reaching like over 95% uh, accuracy and uh, we we're seeing uh, uh, besides this polyp detection task uh, um, many other uh, uh, challenges that are being addressed in the GI space as I discussed before. Uh, another example uh, is a surgical tool detection. Again, a lot a lot of companies are uh, working on uh, on this task. It has multiple applications, both interoperatively, say to predict uh, uh, to to predict what the next tool uh, will uh, be to be used, as well as offline applications. Uh, it's a well-explored field, and uh, uh, the focus uh, these days is uh, on uh, robustness, uh, both to uh, the, the more difficult uh, uh, frames to see, and also generalizability uh, between uh, different procedures and different tissue backgrounds. Typically, it's easy to get uh, data with a lot of tools, uh, but getting data with uh, a lot of different uh, uh, patients or, or cadavers or what have you is more difficult. Uh, so uh, uh, th this this technology is already quite advanced, and from our experience, uh, uh, when you try to apply this in practice, then uh, you come across various trade-offs. So uh, ideally, one would always like their solution to be uh, uh, what, what you'd like your solution to be. Uh, real time, as fast as possible, as accurate as possible, and get as much functionality out of it. You want uh, real time, uh, uh, almost perfect, instant segmentation of tools under all situations. Practice, uh, sometimes there's uh, some uh, trade offs that should be taken into account uh, between these uh, uh, few aspects and to choose the architecture that will most serve uh, the specific application uh, purpose. Uh, another thing that we found here. Uh, we're not the only ones that found this, but uh, we, we we're seeing this uh, uh, firsthand. Is that uh, frame-based classifiers should be boosted by using temporal information? So uh, many times you cannot uh, uh, understand from each and every single frame uh, what's going on, even though uh, identifying tools seems straightforward. But it's not as straightforward as it may look. Uh, and there are various ways to uh, incorporate temporal information. So the graph on the bottom is. Uh, illustration of using a common filter for this, but there are uh, deep learning solutions uh, for this as well. Uh, so we, we've got about 10 minutes left, uh, I see in our time, we've only started a few minutes late. So I, I wanna go through tracking and motion estimation as well. Uh, so uh, just uh, sort of uh, in general terms, how this task breaks down. Uh, so there are two uh, basic situations. In the first situation, we're using the external sensor to track the scope the EM navigation. So there's a magnetic field and there's uh, uh, sensors on the uh, scope itself or on the catheter itself. Uh, so basically you know where your scope is in the device coordinate system. And then the challenge becomes, uh, so you're getting a series of points, you know exactly where your device is, but the challenge becomes, how do you take this coordinate system and register it to anatomy? So, uh, and uh, this uh, tracking is used for uh, many different tasks uh, where uh, you can see uh, uh, pulmonology application uh, navigation in the airways of the lung, uh, in cardiology, in ENT, to navigate in uh, uh, 
in the sinuses, uh, many different applications. So one, one way to do this is to register your uh, uh, tracking uh, ground, your bit, very accurate uh, uh, real-time tracking to some uh, preoperative model of the anatomy, uh, typically CT. Uh, this can be done well if the anatomy is interesting enough, so to speak. So here, if you have a, 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 a branching of the airway tree, then from the scope image, you can tell uh, uh, where you are, especially if you have some initial conditions, and you can register this scope image uh, uh, to the uh, uh, known 3D model from preoperative imaging. Uh, of course, you come up against uh, deformations and movements that need to be uh, corrected. Uh, in other cases, this is done with image-free methods. So on the bottom, you can see uh, uh, this is actually a uh, beginning of a reconstruction process of a heart chamber from the point cloud that is acquired by the catheter itself. So basically, you're not using necessarily any preoperative imaging. You're uh, creating a map of the anatomy as you go along. Uh, this comes with challenges of its own. It's uh, quite time consuming. Uh, if you want to save time uh, and develop an algorithm that's going to uh, uh, apply some model to this, then these algorithms are very mathematically complicated as well as uh, uh, very heavy in terms of running time. Uh, but again, if uh, it, this this uh, 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 th this uh, this way of tracking the sensors and then either registering it to the pre-known anatomy or uh, or uh, creating the model on the fly is uh, uh, very suitable in many cases. Uh, however, this also brings the price of the device up, so it's suitable uh, for some markets and others. It's not, and others, no. We just we just have a scope. We just have the video. Maybe we even have. Uh, a scope that's being used with many different cameras, a uh, lower cost device, and we want to track uh, our position using the video alone. Uh, and uh, so here, we, we're not trying even to match this to some uh, anatomy uh, that's recovered preoperatively, but still there are many applications here that are relevant. So we may want to return to visit some location multiple times during the endoscopic procedure. We want to know if we have returned to a pre previously visited location whether it's in the current procedure or insertion or across uh, different uh, uh, procedures of the same patient. Uh, maybe we want to measure abnormalities. So if we're uh, even segmenting an abnormality in a given frame, we have a, a 2D measurement, so to speak, not really 2D. Uh, uh, you don't know really which angle this abnormality is being viewed from. Uh, but if we combine that with knowing where the scope is, then we can get uh, a linear measurement of the abnormality. Uh, now, tracking using video alone in this kind of soft tissue environment is uh, very challenging. It's not your standard tracking uh, uh, problem that you get, uh, you know, in the surveillance world or the automotive world because you can track feature points, but the tissue itself is changing uh, as you go along. Uh, so this is quite challenging. On the other hand, uh, especially if the anatomy is simple, it's like a one-dimensional anatomy like the esophagus or the colon or the urethra, then this is a mitigation of these algorithmic challenges because we, if we really just need to know in one dimension where our scope is, then uh, we can use uh, that to sort of simplify our tracking problem. Uh, and uh, the methods here, what we find from our experience, uh, need to combine uh, two, uh, two uh, well-known methods in, uh, uh, in the, from the tracking world. So uh, and neither of these is going to be enough on its own. So uh, the first uh, sort of uh, uh, the, fir the first uh, tracking method is detecting feature points and then estimating uh, your speed, your optical flow, uh, or uh, in in other environments you might want to do full slam and sort of reconstruct the whole 3D scene. Here, typically, uh, uh, you wouldn't want to try to do that. You would just want to try to estimate your uh, motion. This will give you a sort of dead reckoning estimate. And, uh, uh, even if you don't see the scene very well, if there are enough feature points to track, you can know if you're going forward and backwards and try to estimate your speed. This, however, must be combined with uh, uh, a more uh, creating sort of a map of the anatomy uh, to, so that you have a ground truth or not really a ground truth, but sort of a GPS kind of thing, because if you're just doing dead reckoning, it's going to drift. On the other hand, if you're only uh, trying to register your current scene to some other previously viewed scene, uh, to know where you are in the anatomy, then you can also lose uh, uh, lose your uh, track at some points because you don't always see similar appearance uh, uh, of the scene, uh, even if you're really at similar locations. So uh, these these two uh, aspects of uh, 
motion estimation and uh, creating a map, a virtual map of the environment, and trying to register yourself uh, to some previous uh, uh, scene uh, need to be combined in other in order to get uh, an effective result. And uh, uh, actually, here some of the methodologies uh, can still uh, be based on uh, uh, the more classical methodologies of detecting feature points. You don't always throw neural networks at this problem, or at least some of it. Uh, but uh, uh, specifically for a uh, uh, similarity measure and for creating an anatomical map and uh, uh, figuring out where you are uh, in terms of the scene appearance, uh, this is a, a very, uh, in, in this case, it's very useful to use uh, deep learning to get a more robust encoding of your scene. So you have a network and a learning feature maps and it's learning how to uh, encode the scene in some uh, brief uh, descriptor and uh, 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 deep learning is definitely the state of the art uh, for encoding uh, your scene in a way that's uh, robust uh, to uh, as many changes as, as, uh, as possible uh, rather than just trying to use cross-correlation or, or, or some uh, classic kind of uh, uh, encoder of the appearance of the scene. So uh, I, I see we only have about uh, five minutes left. Uh, I was going to talk also about action recognition, uh, but uh, I think I'll uh, skip that one. Actually, in two weeks from now, uh, we were scheduled to have our regular uh, Bay Area meetup. Uh, that meetup is now converting to a virtual webinar, uh, and actually I'll be hosting a guest speaker who's going to talk, uh, also going to talk a bit both about uh, action recognition and surgical video as well as, well as uh, a uh, completely different domain of microscopy. Uh, so I think, uh, Shmulik, uh, if it makes sense to you, uh, I think we ought to open it up now uh, for a couple of questions of the last five minutes we have. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. So, uh, Moshe, thank you very much for this uh, uh, fascinating review of uh, the field of AI in endoscopy. Uh, I hope everybody heard uh, something intriguing and learned something new from this uh, review. And please uh, use the, uh, uh, the chat box you have in front of you to, to ask questions. Uh, we'll have time probably to address uh, two or three questions. Uh, so while we're just waiting for that, I have one question that I know uh, uh, many are interested about, and, and that's how do you decide which methodology should be uh, selected in different use cases or in a different project? What are the main things that you need to consider when addressing uh, such a challenge? Thanks. Yeah. So, like many questions, uh, the the short answer is it is uh, it depends. Uh, but the more uh, interesting answer is I think the first question you ask is uh, what what is the data situation? How much data do we have, and what is the quality of that data? And that's going to determine uh, a lot about uh, what type of uh, solution uh, you pick. Uh, the second uh, important rule of thumb is uh, keep it simple. Obviously, try to start with the most uh, uh, simplest uh, solution. Uh, then you look at your results. Uh, and typically, it's, it's not a good idea to start shooting in all directions. Let's try 10 different architectures. Let's try to use video, and let's try to do joint uh, 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 detection, and let's try to, uh, to throw in some pre-processing. Uh, you, you it's better to work in a, a more uh, orderly and uh, methodical manner in which you introduce uh, some uh, incremental change and then experiment and always uh, check empirically uh, uh, the results, uh, compare them empirically. Okay, great. Thank you. I hope that uh, answers that. Another question we have from uh, Tim. How do you get the image data sets? Oh, that's a, that's a common question. All right, what's well, sure. yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's a common question. So I, I maybe that question is also addressed uh, to us specifically as uh, RSIP Vision. Uh, so uh, uh, because we typically work uh, in a service provider uh, mode in which we're uh, creating technology that's enabling uh, the client's device, then in some cases our customers do have access uh, to the relevant uh, uh, data set and then uh, uh, they will provide us with uh, access to that and proper uh, data security uh, uh, procedures uh, for each company. Uh, in, in other cases, then we do have some in-house data sets uh, for some specific applications, less for endoscopy, most more uh, for radiology. And we also have our own uh, network of, uh, of uh, relationships and connections with various hospitals and data providers. Uh, in some cases, we can uh, uh, leverage that. Uh, 
so uh, the, all, all, all of those options are uh, are present uh, depending on the specific uh, application. Okay, great. So uh, I think uh, we just passed half an hour. So one last question uh, that I'm going to ask uh, to read just a second. Um, okay, so we have a question here for Mark. What will be an optimal team for such uh, AI development? How do you choose the yeah. team for that? Good question. So, uh, yeah. So uh, the first uh, the first thing that's important to us when we uh, uh, is to recruit obviously the very best uh, uh, developers, and uh, this means not only programming skills but also uh, people with uh, uh, visual intuition and people with mathematical skills to understand uh, uh, deeply enough uh, how the tools that they are using uh, work. Uh, but uh, the second and no less important part of the team is uh, is the data team. So whether you're interacting with an external uh, provider of ground truth or uh, like a, a physician or whether we're doing this internally, uh, it's uh, very important to create a, a tight interaction and working relationship between those who are uh, annotating the data and uh, creating this ground truth and uh, the developers who are implementing uh, the solution and to close the loop. Uh, quickly, because in almost all cases, uh, uh, you cannot 100% trust your ground truth. Uh, you need to create it uh, 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 sort of uh, with multiple uh, iterations uh, in an interactive manner, and everybody really has to communicate uh, uh, very well uh, with each other. So it's it's a multidisciplinary team, but not only multiple disciplines in terms of uh, the typical background of an AI uh, 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 developer, because uh, some of them uh, are from the computer science background, some physics backgrounds, but also uh, no less important are the other disciplines in the team uh, of the uh, sort of a, a more uh, 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 physical, so to speak, or intensive work of uh, creating the ground truth data and communicating about that uh, ground truth. Great, okay. So that was the last question. I, I see we have a few more, but we have no more time. Uh, so at this stage, I'm going to just say before I say uh, goodbyes, but we're going to send you the recording of uh, the webinar as well. So you'll have it if you want to watch again and then hear something again. And please, if we didn't have the time to uh, respond to your question, feel free to shoot us uh, uh, whatever you want to know, and we'll address that in a separate email. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining. We hope you enjoyed it and uh, keep safe in this crazy time. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.